Hare Krishna. Thank you for coming today evening. And today I'll speak on the Damodar Ashtakam. Does anyone, everyone know about the Damodar Ashtakam? Damodar Ashtakam. So this is one of the most beautiful prayers that is offered to Lord Krishna. And I won't speak on the whole Ashtakam. I'll primarily speak on the first words. But we will look at some important aspects of the nature of Krishna and love for Krishna that are revealed in the Damodar Ashtakam. So, now across the world, people have had some conception of God. They may not even call that higher being as God. But basically when we live in the world, sooner or later we realize that actually the things that I desire, even the things that I need, getting them is not entirely in my control. And therefore, we start thinking, what is it that determines those things? And then, is there some being beyond us who controls those things? So generally, Shri Prabhupada writes that all knowledge comes from God, but all knowledge doesn't begin with God. It's not that suddenly one day people start thinking about God. Our knowledge begins from the things around us. And then we may look, some people look at the big beautiful sky. And then they start thinking, where did all this come from? How was this so beautiful? So our knowledge goes from the world to thoughts of, does the world have a source? Does the world have a controller? Is there someone overseeing all this? So the Damodar is big. So when we understand, maybe there is something up there which is in charge, then the mood becomes of reverence, of respect. That being, that ultimate reality, what it is, whatever it is, it can either, if things can change in the world in such a way, that in one moment, our fortunes can change. We might just get one lucky break and our life can become excellent in one moment things can go terribly wrong so then the idea is that there are forces far bigger than me which which affect my life which shape my my future and maybe that I should have some respect and attention toward toward that now what is that reality so if we consider this verse uh, we'll recite the first line Namamishwaram Satchidananda Rupa. So Namamishwaram Namami. I offer my obeisance. I offer my respects. That is, is the first, first beginning uh, in the biblical tradition. Is that fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. And the person to be most feared is the person who has no fear of God. If somebody has fear of God, then at least they will have some morals. Now this I should not do because I am unaccountable. It has some consequences. Person who has no fear of God, that means they think, hey, if I am just smart enough or strong enough to get away with whatever I do, then I'll do it. And that person is very dangerous. So, Namami. That idea that there is, I need to offer obeisances. I need to be respectful. Toward what? Ishwaram. So the, actually the Bhakti tradition offers us a very intimate vision of God. A vision that actually takes us very, very close and reveals God in uh, great clarity and intimacy. It's like if you are seeing now, distance can be physical, distance can be emotional. 
just like if you're seeing a mountain from a far distance or like you can just like raise the outline but then if you're flying in a plane or a helicopter and the helicopter goes closer and closer and closer then what happens yeah there's so much greenery over here there's this birds flying over there there is this flowers over here there is this waterfall over here as we come closer and closer we see more and more details now this says there can be physical distance and their physical proximity proximity it changes region similarly there can be emotional distance or relational distance if somebody might be a fan of some sports player or some movie star or even some politician and then they know that person from a distance and but if you come if you come close and you work with them talk with them see them in real life then you get to know them better sometimes that you avoid them it's okay i don't need it now if you get to know them better then what happens sometimes we find out oh, such a wonderful i thought is a wonderful person and then you get to know that person you find him not all that wonderful it's sometimes a disappointment sometimes a anti climax those who think they are great he- from a distance you think they are great heroes you find that they have feet of clay but they're not all that great but sometimes if somebody is a really a wonderful person and the closer we get to them the more the more the admiration the attraction the affection increases so in this first line itself it's like in one line you are zooming in you could say light years there are millions of people who have some vague understanding maybe there is something up there and i offer obeisances to it in the mahabharat there is a description that actually when the war was going on between in kurukshetra and duryodhan was very confident that i have a much bigger army does anyone remember to know the figures what was the strength of the army of duryodhan of of the pandavas does anyone know i remember yes Oh, excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Good. So, and 7 plus 11 is how much? What is the significance of 18? 18 Puranas. The war lasted for 18 days. Bhagavad Gita has 18 chapters. So, 18 is a very significant number to them. So, 7 plus 11. So, he thought that my army is so much bigger I am very easily going to win. And then on the seventh day, he was severely battered. Is many many of his warriors were killed, and then he tried. He had a plan to trap Bhima. He sent a whole elephant division to attack Bhima. And then <coughs> Bhima was got Bhima. This elephant division was just routing Bhima's Pandava army. Bhima came there. and you know bima would also fight with bows and arrows but when he would get angry his bow and arrow don't work he just put the bow and arrow down and just charge into the enemy camp with his mace and he was so angry that when he would hit with the mace the elephants would fly away literally and then the whole elephant division was getting routed and duryodhan got furious and he came to attack and now bima couldn't fight both of them so bima attacked him and thwarted him initially He came back again, but Bhima was fighting with all these elephants. So Bhima's son Ghatotkar came over, and Ghatotkar and Duryodhan were fighting, and Ghatotkar defeated and wounded Duryodhan. That was especially humiliating for him. He thought, "I can, I can beat up the father, but his son beat me up." <laughs> so that night, he some you know, that night he had sober down a little bit. he asked bishma how is it that my army is so much bigger in number my army has generals like you and drona and yet we are being defeated what's happening so then bishma said that oh duryodhan i have been crying myself hoarse trying to tell you that 
on whichever side there is Keshava. In the Mahabharata, Krishna is referred more by the name Keshava than Krishna. Whichever, wherever there is Keshava, he is supreme. Wherever there is Keshava, I will be with him. And now he has heard it many times, but he had never taken it seriously. So then, this time he says, because he has really been beaten up. <coughs> so then he asks, tell me more about Krishna. And then in Duryodhana's assembly, Bhishma does Krishna Katha. He tells Krishna's past time, how Krishna lifted Govardhan hill, how Krishna killed so many demons who came in so many dangerous forms. And Bhishma, and Bhishma is ecstatic. And Duryodhana is very sober. And that night he goes to his tent. And then he is about to sleep. He thinks, if Krishna is really God, this, if Krishna is God, then there is no harm in offering obeisance to him. So he turns in the direction of Krishna's tent and goes down. And then goes to sleep. And that's how even Bhishma is more advanced than that. So Namami, Namami Ishwara. Even Duryodhana does that. But the problem is that for some people, spiritual knowledge is like light. And for some people, spiritual knowledge is like lightning. <laughs> what is the difference between light and lightning? Yeah, lightning just it illumines, but only for a short while. So Duryodhana had strong attachments. I have to get this kingdom. So the next time when he woke up, next morning when he woke up, he walked back to the default mood. He defaulted back to his dark mood. The change did not last. But sometimes when we see some display of power far greater than ours, that can make us realize there is something godly over here. And let me offer my respect. So Namami Ishwara. It's often for some people the idea of God is associated with greatness, a power far bigger than our power. And when we see that, oh, let me offer respect. And it's good, something unknown, but there is not just some vague power, but some maybe there's personal control. So, from obeisances to the idea of a controller, and then Ishwaram, and then goes further. What is that person? The controller is. Satchit Anand The idea of God is sometimes very difficult for people to understand, especially if we talk about God as having form. Because if we think God is all powerful, then we think that if generally God is said to have three main attributes. The this we have omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent, yeah. So he's present everywhere, he knows everything, and he can do everything. Now, if God is omnipresent, then how can he have a form? If I have a form, you have a form. If you are here in this room, then you cannot be at your home. Because our, our, we are limited by our form to a particular location. And we often have this conception. So here the word Rupa is used, is Rupam, here is a form. But what kind of form? Satchitananda Rupam. Satchitananda means that this is an eternal form. Sat is eternal. Chit is, is made of consciousness. It's, and Ananda is blissful. So actually, this means that this form is non-living. Sometimes what happens in science is when there is a concept of causation and correlation. All of you know about the idea of vocabulary. Vocabulary is how many words we know. So this is an interesting thing that people who have bigger hands, science has found that they have bigger vocabularies. <laughs> Now, if they say, how, what is that got to do with this? Bigger hands and bigger vocabulary? 
Uh, now I will say this, this is strange, but all that it means is people who have smaller hands are small in age. They have not learned enough words. <laughs> 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 People who have bigger hands, they are older <laughs> and naturally they have learned enough words. So the, the correlation is true. Smaller hands, smaller vocabulary. Bigger hands, bigger vocabulary. But there is, there is correlation but it's not causation. The big hands are not the cause of big vocabulary. Both of them are the cause of, are caused by something else. When the person grows up, their vocabulary grows and their hands also grow. So, causation and correlation are two different things. And if we don't understand the difference, then what happens? Just because we see two things together, we think, okay, these two are, these two are interrelated as if a cause-effect chain. So, the same principle applies to form and limitation. The, the, most people, they have this problem with how can God have a form? Because it's limited. But here there is a the presumption is that when we talk about form causing limitation, let's let's take it the other way. Suppose form is removed. Suppose say some suppose they're staying in this house now. And we are living in this house. Suppose this house crumbles. Then we will have a formless heap over here. Now, would that formless heap be limited or unlimited? Limited, isn't it? So, even if the form is removed, the limitation remains. So, it is not that the form is the cause of limitation. Form, in one sense, gives a visible shape and we can say it's limited. But, even if the form is removed, then still the limitation remains. The limitation is caused not by form. It is caused by matter. Matter, whether it is with form or without form, is limited. And spirit is, whether it is with form or without form, spirit has the potential to be unlimited. So what we are doing is, when there is a, <clears throat> we see a correlation. Form means limitation. But, and if, so therefore, if some, there is something unlimited, there should be no form. But in this case, the limitation, it's a correlation, it's not a causation. The form is not the cause of limitation. The form and limitation, which we see, that is because it's matter. When something is not made of matter, then it's not limited. Let me say, how do I understand this? At least let's consider something which is not exactly non-material, but something subtle. If you look at our own thoughts, our thoughts can go so fast. You, know, you, might, be, you might be thinking right now in this room, you are looking at hearing something sub subject over here. And in the next moment, you might be thinking about uh, maybe our home. Next moment, you might be thinking about maybe, okay, India is going to go to the moon. Or maybe I want to be a space scientist. I want to go to the moon. Or we can think of anything and everything. So our thoughts go very fast. Let me say, actually, it's just the thoughts you are going, it's not going, I'm just thinking about it. But then, sometimes, when somebody is absent-minded, their, their body is there, but they are not there, essentially. Their thoughts are somewhere else. So our thoughts are not, in a sense, limited by the laws of physics as we know them. Thought energy can flow anywhere. So, if it's subtler than thoughts, is the consciousness which has thoughts, which thinks. So, at the level of consciousness, there is no limitation. So, what is the point being made? This Lord is Ishvara, but He is Satchit Ananda. He has a form, but that form is not ordinary. That form is divine. That form is transcendental. Satchit Ananda. And what happens because He is Satchit Ananda? He can, so God has a form, but God is not limited to his form. He is at one place, but if he wants, he can be at many places. He can expand himself. Can you think of any pastimes in which Krishna expands himself? Yes, in the Ras Leela, when he dances 
Another pastime? Yes, Brahma seeing the cows. Because he expands as many cows, as many, as many cows, and as many cowboy boys. So Krishna expands himself. So although he has a form, he is not limited to his form. And not only is he not limited to his form, that means he can have many, many forms, but also his form is not limited to one place. That means, if we see, although Krishna in the battlefield of Kurukshetra is one person situated in one place, he is situated on a chariot, which is in one battlefield, which is in one country, which is on one planet, which is within one universe. But although Krishna is within the universe, the universe is within him. That's what he shows in the universal form. So that means Krishna is not limited to his form and his form does not limit him in any way. So even within a limited form, he can manifest an unlimited universe. And this pastime will also reveal this. Because if you see this whole pastime, is centered around the form of Krishna. Of course, the center is the love between Krishna and Yashoda. But that love is manifested around the, the form of Krishna. When Yashoda tries to, tries to tie Krishna and she is unable to tie for a long time. So, Prabhupada says that whenever love is there, the love has to be specific. It's like any emotion, the emotions become tangible when they become specific. Now, so next month, Thanksgiving will come. So, what has happened? Social psychologists have found that positive emotions like gratitude are very helpful. They are conducive to health, they are conducive to well being. So, you should be grateful. But there are, there are many people who are strongly anti antitheistic. <laughs> there are atheists and there are antitheists. Atheists are those who don't believe in God. Antitheists are those who are opposed to God. They are militantly opposed to God. So many people they don't accept God, but they, but they still want to cultivate great gratitude. They say, okay, life is so good. I'm grateful. Who am I grateful to? You know, I'm just grateful to them. <laughs> And to say that I am grateful in general is like saying I am married in general. <laughs> no, marriage is in particular. There <laughs> is no marriage in general. Whom are you married to? No, I am married in general. <laughs> it has no meaning. <laughs> so, uh, emotions are like that. When there, when the particular object of the emotion, when the emotions are activated, they become real. They become more tangible. So, if God were just a formless ex infinity, so somebody might say, okay, God is like the sky. It's a formless infinity. Okay, now how do you love the sky? You just look at the sky and you may like the sky. And looking at the sky will make us feel peaceful. But we can't have a personal connection with the sky. So, the whole idea, it's, it's the reciprocation of love between Krishna and Ishwada is there. But it's all centered around the form of Krishna. So, Namami Shwaram Satchit Ananda Rupam. The whole, there's love, but the, the magic of that love is centered on the magical form of Krishna. And then, what is, what is so special about that form? That, is, that comes in the next verse. What is the next verse? Lasat Kundalam Gopule Rajivam. Lasat Kundalam. So normally, when we look at a person, generally, we, we look at the whole person, but usually we look at the face of the person. That is where the face is the index, in the index of the mind, the index of the person. How, when we say that somebody, how their looks are, it's primarily the face. They are attractive, they may be angry, they may be scared, they may be upset, whatever. It's, it's primarily, when we interact with the person, we look at their face. So now when the focus goes on this face, as I said, if the camera is zooming closer and closer and closer. So from the vast infinity that there is a un in there's some unknown controller, the camera is zooming closer and closer. And not just to the divinity that has a specific form, but the divinity that is doing the specific activity. Lasat kundalam. So kundala is what? Here, yes. 
So Lasat is graceful, beautiful. Lasat Kundala, so he, he, his, his earrings are beautiful. And Gokule Rajamani. Gokule, in the land of Gokula, Rajamani. is luminous, is shining. This conception of divinity as is revealed in the Bhakti tradition is, is very enduring. So sometimes <coughs> Prabhupada was, Prabhupada would say that, since ultimately we are all talking about love of God and you talk about different religious traditions. And Prabhupada would say, Jesus said, I am the son of God. But Jesus did not give much specific knowledge about who is God. Prabhupada says, Krishna says, I am Pita Ahamasi I am the father of all the gods. So then, many Christians will sometimes say that actually, if the God that Jesus referred to is Krishna, then why didn't Jesus say that? The Prabhupada gave many different answers. One time Prabhupada said, you know, whatever Jesus told, for that you killed him. So how could he tell more? <laughs> <laughs> so, that's one answer. But other part he says is that, we have generic attributes of God and we have specific description of God. So if we consider the Bhakti tradition, what it says is, there are six opulences of Krishna. What are the six opulences? Beauty, wealth, knowledge, fame, renunciation and strength. Yeah. So now, these six attributes if anybody is beautiful. Now, will any traditions say that our God is ugly? <laughs> Nobody will say that. <laughs> will no any tradition say that our God is a weakling? <laughs> Obviously not. <laughs> so beauty, strength, fame, knowledge, all these are universal attributes of God. So now what the reasoning which you can use over here is simple. Say, <clears throat> If somebody just walks into this house and they say, I am the president of America. You mean? Now we have reason to be skeptical. But if somebody comes in and they have the power to control the American army, the American Navy, the American Air Force, by their command they can dispatch, they just talk. So now if anybody can make a claim that I am the I am the president of America. But the President of America has certain powers, certain attributes. So, if somebody has these attributes, you could say it's reasonable to say that this is the President of America. So, similarly, Prabhupada says, these are the attributes. Similarly, we can say based on this definition, these are the attributes of God. Will any tradition say that these are not attributes? No. no. Everybody knows. So some people say, is God renounced? That might be a question. Now, people may not be attracted to renunciation, but people are attracted to the fruit of renunciation. What is the fruit of renunciation? Tyaga Shanti Ranantaram. When there is renunciation, then there is peace. In general, even people who are not spiritual, they appreciate somebody who is very peaceful, very calm, very composed. When life shakes us up, when there are disturbances, and somebody says stoic, somebody says phlegmatic, how do you stay so cool? And that coolness is actually a result of renunciation. That's why we appreciate it, not everyone. So these are the attributes of God. These six are the attributes of God. And Prabhupada says, here is a person who fits the bill. Here is a person who exhibits those opulences. So if you have another person who fits those opulences, let's see. But there is no such description of the specific personality of God in other traditions. So it's not sectarian, it's universal. So what is happening over here is Rasat Kundalam Gokule Rajamani. This vision of God is that now normally people think of God as some being who is high up in the sky and you know, maybe he short throat and who is a judge and he casts thunderbolts and the sinful and sends them to hell forever. Now that is one conception of God. But the idea is, if God was simply a judge, now one of my friends is a judge in a court, and he told me that he likes his job, 
it's, it's exhausting. It's a job. You're constantly judging for people. Why has this person speaking the truth? What is the right thing? What is the wrong thing? He told me that if some if I had to be a judge for eternity, I would soon resign from that job. If now if God for the rest of eternity has nothing to do except be a judge, then the job of God would be a very boring job. So what the what the Bhakti tradition says is yes, being a judge is one aspect of God's job description. Just as people they may have a professional role, but they also have personal life, how they are at home. So Bhakti the Bhakti tradition reveals how God is at home. Vrindavan Gokula is God's home. And how he is at home is revealed over here. And this kind of revelation is not there in any other tradition. It's how God is in his home. And what is described over here? Gokule Brajmana. He is luminous. He's, he is he is uh, this is a beautiful child. Now, people may not know about Gokul, but they want to go cool. <laughs> <laughs> but the real way to go <laughs> but the real way to go cool is to go to Gokul. <laughs> so when we connect with the Lord of Gokul. When you develop love for Gokul, for Gokul Vindan Krishna, then that is when we actually go cool. And we don't get so agitated by the world's ups and downs. Now, in Gokul, the word Gokul, what does it mean? Go is what? Cow. So Gokul is the abode of cows. And Krishna is a god who delights in simplicity. Now, in his abode, he plays a simple instrument, a flute. He wears a peacock feather. He, he is, is, if you say people love to have pets, Krishna's pet is who? The cows and the cows. Now, he is Gokule Brajamana. So Krishna is just a small child. And what is he? So he has his, in this, he, he has his earring. And he's like a kundalam. His hearing is shiny. So actually, as I said, the vision is going closer and closer and closer. Uh, it's describing a particular activity. So now, why is this hearing shining? It is if somebody is running. And what happens? They're running. That ear, if they have hearing, hearing, the hearing moves up and down. So like that, Krishna's hearing is moving. That's a kundalam. Now, why is it? Why is it moving like that? Because he is running. And now why is he running? That is described in the third line. <laughs> so now, what is the second line? Lasat Kundalam Gokule Rajamana. In this line of Gokule, shining, it's effulgent, it's attractive. This is the vision of God who is wearing an earring and he is running. He is, why is he running? Yashoda Yoluka Ladava Manam. Out of fear of Mother Yashoda, he's running. When the European colonial, colonialists came to India, and especially when they came to North India, to the Mathura area, and there were these beautiful wall murals and paintings of Krishna eating butter. So then they would see there's so many pictures and they asked. Is, who is this? So this is a small, attractive boy crawling on the ground. So that is God. What is he doing? So he is stealing butter. So they just got intellectually short circuited. <laughs> <laughs> So, 
Now look, those ideas could make sense. So the point here is that Krishna, in his home, he doesn't delight in his God. In home, in his home, he simply delights in the reciprocation of love. And for that reciprocation of love, he takes the role that is most appropriate. So there are devotees who want to love him as a child. They want to be the parent of God or whatever. And Krishna <coughs> accommodates that. Yad yad diya tu urugaya vibhava yanti tad tadva pranya se tad anagrahaya. Right, in the Bhagavatam it is said that Brahmaji is praying, my dear Lord, whichever form your devotee desires to worship you in, you manifest in that form for them to know. That is your mercy on the devotee. So if some devotee desires to have the Lord as their child, now philosophically speaking, it's impossible. Because God is the source of everyone. He is the parent of everyone. Nobody can be the parent of God. So in terms of philosophy, it's not possible. But in terms of uh, pastimes, Krishna can manifest that. So he manifests as a small child. And that is, again, the same principle. Although he manifests as a small child, he is not just a small child. He can do things which even a big child can't do. Or not just a big child, even a big man can't do. He has that power. So he is manifesting as a small child. And he is stealing. Now why does he have to steal? Because Krishna doesn't have to steal anything. Everything belongs to him. But the whole idea in Krishna Leela is that there is there is excitement and excitement is created whenever there is some kind of opposition to do something if you are playing a game now if the game is very easy to play and win like say if it's a, it's a cricket match between say india maybe india is the world number one and maybe some if you consider cricket or something like that then Maybe some country like Holland, which is not even in the top 15 or top 20. So if it's a match like that, then it's always predicted who's going to win. There's always excitement in the match. Usually excitement comes when there is some opposition. And oh, there's this opposition that creates some suspense. Or oh, will this opposition be overcome? How will it be overcome? There was this uh, in this uh, uh, Western fiction characters who came, who was invented first, you know, Spider Man or Superman? <laughs> well, Superman. Okay, anyway, so what happened was maybe it was Superman that they had this idea that Superman, as the, the character started evolving, they started making him more and more powerful. So, Superman eventually, you know, he could just, even if a whole planet came to attack. He could just breathe and destroy the planet. So then, what happened? As they made Superman more and more powerful, the popularity of Superman started going down. <laughs> then they had to create Superman as having some weaknesses, as having some vulnerabilities. You know, a particular kind of rays he's not able to, he's not able to, can't be protected against that, and the enemies would attack by those rays. So in general, if somebody is so powerful, no, nothing can match them. Then there is no suspense, there is no excitement. So, in the case of Krishna, although he is all powerful, he doesn't act as if he is all powerful. And to create excitement, now Mother Yashoda can give him butter. If he wants to eat, she will happily give it. But just to have that excitement, Krishna does something which is not true. And that is stealing. So in stealing, oh, will, will we get will we get caught or will we not get caught? We will run away. If you run away, will, how will other people, if they catch, how will you escape from it? All that excitement is created. So the whole point of Krishna is to create excitement. So Krishna steals not because he's a thief. Krishna steals because that is an excitement. And, and that's why when he's stealing, what is he stealing? He's just butter. At one, at one level, because the butter is the butter is not a very valuable product. It's not like a not like gold or something like that. But in the case of Vrindavan, what happens is butter represents 
the love of the devoted heart. Just like milk when churn together, so it becomes butter. So similarly, a devotee's heart, when it's churned by the practice of bhakti, it becomes like butter. And Krishna comes and he steals the butter. So Krishna is known by one name, which points to his stealing. What is that name? Sorry, Navanit Chor, uh, Navanit Taskar. Anything else? Makan Chor. Okay, but any name which is about stealing but not necessarily about butter? Hari. Yes. Nobody is in a hurry to carry this name. Huh? <laughs> so, Hari, one who does Hari, one who steals. So, Krishna steals our heart. Then it becomes soft like that. So, what is Krishna doing? Krishna, when he steals, he's actually just doing something which is exciting and endearing for his devotees. So, Yashoda, Viyodukha, Nantavana. And this whole verse is actually describing the amazing nature of this conception of God. I, I started by saying how fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. And those who, are, those who don't fear God, they are really fearful. That they, we should be afraid of them. Because then they have no morals, they have no scruples, they have nothing to check them. So normally, of course, we don't want to stay at the level of fear of God. We want to develop love of God also. But fear of God is a foundation. But what is happening here, instead of talking about fear of God, we have fear in God. God is afraid. Yeshoda, Bhiyolukha, Nadda. Or the complete hierarchy is inverted over it. The soul is normally afraid of God, but here God is afraid of a soul. How can that be? And that is the wonder of Lila. That now, if we, this is when we want to have a relationship with someone. A real relationship means that there is an entire gamut of emotions. If, if it just we tell them somebody to do something and they do it. Okay, you might have a relationship with a master and sir only. But it's not a particularly rich relationship. In a rich relationship, various emotions are there. Sometimes anger is there. Sometimes excitement is there. Sometimes appreciation is there. Sometimes admiration is there. Sometimes exasperation is there. So a rich relationship is ornamented by various emotions. Just like in a meal, no, we have different flavors. And all the different flavors make the meal tasty. So Krishna also, in his relationships, wants to have the rich gamut of emotions. And, in a sense, although normally we don't want fear. But it is not that we never want fear. If, if, if fear was always an unwanted emotion, then horror movies wouldn't be so popular. <laughs> when people go and watch horror movies, what are they doing? They want to be scared. Earlier in horror movies, there are these, what, uh, what do you call this? This rides in the roller coasters. And then suddenly it goes down and people are scream. And then they're scared. But after that, they enjoy it. I want to do it again. <laughs> so what is happening? That in our life, we want to experience various kinds of emotions. So fear, as in sense of, uh, if it's indicative of mortal danger, then it cause death. That, that's of course something we don't want. But fear also, because it hikes up the nervous system, it makes us more alert, it makes us more receptive, more. So fear is also something which is experienced in relationship. And if God is truly complete, then God shouldn't be deprived of any of the emotions that we humans have experienced. So then, even fear also is excluded. He's in such fear that he's running, he's running away. From who? From his mother. So, his mother is upset with him, angry with him, and he's running. Now, normally, the soul is seeking God, but God is far away. But here, God is running and the mother is seeking. 
And not only that, what happens? Eventually, last line is what? Paramrishtam atyan ato drupte gopya. So, oh, this gopi, she's not even an extraordinary, like an ascetic woman with mystic powers. She's simply a common woman, a gopi. And what happens? Paramrishtam. She has run, she has run faster than Krishna and she has caught Krishna. Atyan ato drupte gopya. Drupte means something very difficult to Shri Prabhupada gave one of his disciples the name Dutta Karma. Dutta Karma means one who can do very difficult work. So this work of catching Krishna is extremely difficult. So she has run faster than Krishna and she has caught Krishna. And that is something which is incredible. It's like there, is, there are the ideas of the inversion of hierarchy. Say there is a, say there is like a time, maybe there's a seven foot thief, and there is a, maybe a, a, a police who is like a four feet dwarf, and the four feet dwarf goes and catches the seven foot thief. How does that happen? So you change the hierarchy much, much more. The soul is tiny, and Krishna is unbreakable. But this tiny soul. One soul, Ishida mind has caught Krishna. And that is the power of love. That will be described in the next verse. But this is an endearing vision. It's like sometimes uh, a movie. When a movie is to be promoted, it's not yet released. So they give a trailer. And generally, whenever in any story, what catches attention is Unexpected turns, unexpected twists and turns. So it's like usually uh, when somebody is uh, writing a, say, if somebody is writing a novel, or somebody they have a TV series of episodes. And when one episode is completing, then if people they want people to come and watch the next episode, then usually they have like a cliffhanger ending. Cliffhanger literally means what? Maybe the hero and villain are fighting and the villain beats the hero and the hero is just falling off a cliff and he's holding on. And the, hero, the villain is going to pound his feet on the hands, his feet on the hands of Krishna, the hero and get into a fall. And to be continued next <laughs> <laughs> So, when it comes like that, then people are captivated. Oh, what is this? I want to know more about this. So just as in some serials, you can have cliffhanger ending. So like that, here, this is the cliffhanger trailer. It's, it, this is the endearing conception that God is running away in fear and God gets caught. So what, kind, what kind of God is this? What is going on over here? So the first verse is so incredibly revealing about the extraordinary conception of God which is there in and this is the God who is conquered by love. That will come in the next verse. That God is so hungry, so eager, so eager for love, that for the sake of love, he is even caught, he is even bound. And it is that all of us in our heart, we long for love. Everything that we do, we might get a, we might get a degree, we might get a job, we might get a position, we might get our car. So everything that we try to get, they might be physical positions or they might even be personal attributes. We try to look good, we try to speak fluently, we try to act in a smart way. All these we try to acquire or develop in the hope of attracting love. Now we all need love, we all want to love, we need love. And we try to acquire many things so that we can attract love. But actually, this psychology, it comes originally from God. This says we hunger for love, God also hungers for love. And he hungers not just for love, he hungers for our love. Your love and my love. And how much he's hungry for love, generally it's seen by, is how much is a person ready to give up for love. 
So God is ready to give up his Godhood just to experience in Jesus. And that is revealed in this beautiful pastime of Ramadan, where God becomes tied by the love of his devotees. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on this conception of this beautiful conception of divinity that is revealed in the Damodarashtaka. It's over. We be, our knowledge begins not with God, but begins with the world and its source. Maybe there is something which controls the world. Let me offer my obeisance to you. Just like Duryodhana also offered obeisance to Krishna because he saw Krishna's form. Ishwara. Maybe there is some controller who is bigger than you. So it's like a camera is zooming closer and closer to you. First, there is some unknown force which I need to go down to. Maybe there is some personal controller. And then we go further and the Bhakti says that personal controller has a form. How can there be a form? We talk about form doesn't limit, it is matter that limits. We talk about the difference between causation and correlation. Big hand and big vocabulary are correlated, but they are not causal. So similarly, form and limitation or formlessness and uh, form and limitation are correlated. The cause of the limitation is not determined in the form, it is matter. So then the God is God is God has a form, but he's not limited to his form. He can manifest in many forms, and in his limited seeming form, he can manifest the whole universe. And what is he doing as you move closer and closer? Vasat Kundalam Gopini Rajaman. He is in the abode of Gopini. He's a coward boy. His pet is coward. He delights in simplicity. So, this is a, at one level a universal conception of God as well as a specific revelation of God. The universal conception is that. God has these six attractive opulences, which every tradition will accept. But who is a person who fits that bill? So it's like the president. Who is the president of America? One who has the powers of the president. There is no specific such description in any tradition, but the Bhakti tradition offers us that. Here is a person who fits that bill. And thus, it is now, although God is all powerful, in his Gokul is his home. So we see a person in his home, they don't delight in their God, in their power. They delight in the reciprocation of love. And for the reciprocation of love, he subordinates his God. And he takes the role and the form that his devotee desires. So he becomes a child for those devotees who want to love in a desire. Yashoda Biyonukala Tavadana. So how can God be a child? That's out of love. Why does God steal? Because I talked about that. Generally, excitement is proportional to opposition. So for God, in one sense, there is no opposition. So he is omnipotent. But he, he creates a setting where there is apparent opposition so that there is excitement. So he still is not because he is a thief, but he just wants to increase the sweetness in the excitement in the relationship. And he steals butter because butter is the fruit of the love of his mother's heart and hands by which she has churned the milk and made it into butter. Milk and curd and made into butter. So the, our heart also becomes churned and soft like butter. Krishna comes and steals it. And how can he be fearful? Uh, people have fear of God, but God has fear of his mother. Why? Because now a rich relationship has all emotions. And although fear is normally not considered attractive, but fear also has its charm in terms of say people watch horror movies and go on roller coasters. So God is not deprived of fear. So he experiences fear. And his mother is angry with him. And then, although God is all powerful, nobody can catch him, but he is caught by Mother Yashoda. It's an in, incredible work to do. How is she able to do it? That is because of love. So God is so hungry for love that he's even ready to be not only subordinated, but kept, but bound by his devotees. So we all hunger for love because we are all parts of he also hungers for love. But when we direct our love towards him, then our longing for love is eternally and perfectly fulfilled. So the Damodar Mela is a revelation of how loving God is. And that revelation can inspire us to direct our heart's love towards such a loving God. 
Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Any questions or comments? Sometimes some say somebody is a champion, absolutely champion runner. They dedicate themselves for running just because they love running. They, they don't, uh, they're not looking for anything else to do. I say yes and no. Yes in the sense that all of us have a particular kind of body and mind. And with each body and mind, there are certain activities and actions compatible. And those activities and actions are kept. So somebody might like to write, somebody might like music, somebody might like uh, art, but they just love it, they're immersed in it. So in this case, it's, it's if something is compatible to the way of our body and mind, then we do it because it just, everything flows smoothly. At the same time, I, at a, we, there is one thing, there are various degrees of harmony. One level of harmony is, Harmony with our own body and mind. Okay. And if that harmony is not there, then there's constant irritation in the body and mind. Okay. But that is not the only harmony that is there. Even somebody who's an artist, they also would like to bond with other artists. I am a writer, I have written many books. So I bond with many different people. But somebody else who's a writer, and if I bond with them, then it's it's a very deep connection. So it's a, it is we all need harmony in the physical mental level also with our own body and mind, and it makes us it brings a certain level of joy and fulfillment to us. But that alone is not enough. We have various needs. We have a need to be in harmony with our body and mind. We have a need to be in harmony with the people around us, or at least some people around us. We have a need to be in harmony with the environment around us. And I'll, these are the three circles in which this whole is situated. We talk about the three kleshas, Adi Atmik, Adi Bhautik, Adi Daivi. So these are the literally, literally three circles in which you are situated. The body mind circle is the Adi Atmik. The social circle is the Adi Bhautik. The environmental circle is the Adi Daivi. So we need harmony with all of these. But ultimately, the most important harmony that we need is the harmony with the heart. The heart needs to connect. So we might be, uh, we might be doing something which we love to do, but there's no kind of connection in the heart. But if there is no one who really appreciates, there are many fans, but even those people, celebrities who are fans, they want somebody close to them. Sometimes you know, you know, fans, uh, sometimes the fans can become burdens. Yeah. <laughs> And there is the, see, sometimes the irony of fame is people work very hard to become famous. And after they become famous, they wear goggles so that nobody recognizes them and they get bored. <laughs> so they, they don't want the superficial admiration. They want deeper connection. So we, uh, that is also a human need. And it's not to be denied. But ultimately, when we do that also, we want it. We want somebody to understand us, somebody to appreciate us, somebody to love us. Not superficially, but but in a deeper way. Can I answer your question? Thank you. Good question. Any other question? Okay. We have about something you said earlier. So, like, I'm not exactly sure how to formulate this question, but the idea is that you mentioned that we are limited by our form, but Krishna is not limited by his form. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then, at least the way you're saying it, somehow that, that could 
be taken to undermine the the absoluteness of the form of Krishna because we consider the form of Krishna absoluteness to be at the same level. So it's okay, right. Okay, let me ask you. So if we say that Krishna is not limited by his form, uh, does does that not compromise the absoluteness of Krishna's form? Could Krishna, we say Krishna and his form is non different. Yes, there is the also the principle of achieving the Bhagavad, the single oneness and difference. So the idea is that God manifests through different levels. There is, as you know, the all pervading effulgence of God is called Brahman. There is a localized controller, that is the that is the Paramatma, and then there is Bhagavan, who is the all attractive supreme person. There are various conceptions of God. Rather, you could say there are various levels of understanding of God. The one way to understand this is in a in a progression of spiritual understanding. We look at the world and we see that everything is changing. The big buildings they may crash one day, the mountains may also get eroded. And then we start thinking, is there some some unchanging substratum? Uh, below all that is constantly changing. And the answer is no. There's something spiritually unchanging. And that is seen as what is ultimate. So the idea that there is a un universal, unchanging substratum to reality, that is the impersonal life, that is the Brahman. It's all for me. So, Jiva Goswami, one of our prominent Acharyas, he says that when we conceive of the Absolute as universal, undifferentiated consciousness, universal, undifferentiated, unchanging consciousness, that is the Brahman we have. That's one aspect of God. But another aspect of God is that, yes, there is this universal, undifferentiated consciousness, but there is also, there is also a conscious being who is overseeing the world. So basically, the, in the impersonal understanding of God, consciousness is envisioned as this mere string. So like right now you are looking at me, I am looking at you. So if you are looking at me, then in the conscious experience, your experience of me, there are three things. There is you who are the subject of consciousness. From you, there is a stream of consciousness that is coming to me. And I am the object of consciousness. So in the impersonal understanding, the, the object, the object and the subject are both considered to be real. And all that exists is only the stream of consciousness. The stream, only the stream of consciousness exists. But that doesn't make much sense because consciousness needs to have a subject and object. Otherwise, who is conscious? Something has to be conscious. So the next level is the idea of what? There is a conscious being who is overseeing the world. That is the Paramatma. So beyond just a stream of consciousness, it is also a center of awareness. And then the further understanding is that there is not just a center of awareness, <coughs> that there is a the, the, who is overseeing the material world. That center, that conscious being also has a personal life in the future. So to see that that consciousness has material potencies. Material potencies means the potency to oversee the material world. That is the Paramatma realization. But within the consciousness also has spiritual potency. That means at a spiritual level, this consciousness reciprocates love with other conscious beings. That is the Bhagavan realization. So when we when we say Krishna's form is absolute, that is definitely true. But it's not a it's not a simplistic idea that this is Krishna and that's all there is to know. See, we need to understand that. This is Krishna, and this is more than what I see as this. So that's why to understand God, we need to begin with the definition of God, not the depiction of God. If you begin with the depiction of God, you know, this is just one image in a place, how can this be God? So we have to begin with the definition of God. So God's definition is itself multi level. And there is, there is a personal aspect, there is a there is Brahman, Paramatma, Bhagavan. And when Krishna, and God is not limited by his form, what I mean is that 
Actually, Krishna is the person of one particular place, but he is not just that. Or rather, that form is not simply what we conceive it is. That's why we could say there is, there is impersonal, personal, and there is transpersonal. Transpersonal is transcendental personality. So Krishna's personality is not like ours. And he is not different from his form, and yet he is also the all pervading Brahman. He is also the Paramatma. And that's why his form is not into what we conceive. Any last question? So thank you very much. Siddhamada Rashtakam ki. Sri Krishna Bhagavan ki. Srila Prabhupada ki. Gaur Bhakti.